Isn't it great to see young people like that? Please be seated. I <laughs> thank you. Thank you, members of the Orange High School uh, Marine ROTC. You're great kids. Uh, three boys and one girl, I might point out. Um, now you've got a real treat in front of you. This great book, Oliver North, He's written several. He's been here several times. Each time uh, that he's put out a book, he's been kind enough to come here and present it and sign it. Counterfeit Lies isn't even out yet. It's out on the 10th. So we got him first. So really, this is the launch of it. And it's always, it, it's always a great honor to introduce him, ladies and gentlemen. Colonel Oliver North, Marine Colonel, two Purple Hearts, Deputy Director of the National Security Council under our good President Reagan, a Fox News military analyst. Please welcome Colonel Oliver North. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you all. That, Sandy said, my mission is to keep us on schedule so there can be no more outbursts like that. For how many of you got in here early enough to see some of the video that was playing beforehand? Today, that's good. Uh, if you want to see more of that, you go to OliverNorth.com and click on Normandy, a hero returns. And I'm not the hero on that. John Perosi is, and I want, to, I want to just start with a little bit of that and, and hopefully leave you with some inspiration. I'm going to have my good friend Bob Hamer come on up and we're going to talk about a book that he and I have just finished and they've published, spelled both our names correctly. Uh, grateful for you being here to, to launch this, this effort for the, I think the seventh time, if I'm, if I'm right, Sandy. But I, I want to just ask you, how many of you here have either served in the military or are the spouse of someone who has served in the military. If you'd please raise your hands. Now look around the room. Look around the room. Thank you. 70 years ago today, 70 years ago today, 126,000 young Americans crossed a beach called Omaha Beach and Utah Beach on the Norman Peninsula of France. I had the great blessing to be able to go back there with John Perosi, who was a member of the 82nd Airborne Division. He actually parachuted in along with 12,999 of his comrades at H hour minus six, meaning roughly 30 minutes after midnight. They'd taken off on the 5th of June 1944 from air bases all over England, 2,500 airplanes converging to drop them all along the beaches, but miles inland behind enemy lines on the beach to cut off the German opportunity to reinforce or to push the Allies back into the water. John Perosi was dropped into an LZ drop zone about three miles from St. Mary Glees. And John Perosi was wounded the next day on the 7th. He had fought all the better part of that day with a bullet lodged about an inch from his heart and didn't even know how badly he'd been hurt until blood loss forced him to his knees. And the medic brought him to the Notre Dame church where one of his 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment comrades, John Steele, think about how things work in life. The guy that you all saw, how many of you saw the movie Saving Private Ryan? Well, that, that scene is in there, and that scene is being replicated right now in France because they've hung a person wearing an 82nd Airborne Division uniform and a reserve parachute. They've hung it on the side of Notre Dame Church in saint mary Glise, exactly where it happened. And that's in the video that we put up, and you can see it again just by going to that website, and you can click on it and watch the whole 14 minutes. Think about what it would have been like if the guy who was hanging on the edge of that steeple, waiting for a French person to reach out and pull him in so he could climb back down and join his comrades, if his name was Llewellyn Fernmeister. 
uh, you know, Joe Bonatz. Instead, his name is John Steele. Real name. And as I learned on each of the times I've been to Normandy, there is a John Steele pub in St. Mary Glees. It just wouldn't work if it was Llewellyn Feinmeister or Joe Bonatz, but it was John Steele. And he passed this past year, didn't get to be back. One of the things that John Perosi told me while we were there, I asked him for his most memorable moment, and it doesn't make its way into the video because so much of the, the video is very, very straightforward and very moving. And I asked John, St John Perosi, who was a 20-year-old when he came into the United States Army, volunteered to serve even though he did not have to. He was exempted from service because he was a master welder building a ship called the USS New Jersey. Now, I want, you, I want to give you the connections of life. He goes in 1942 and says, I can't do this anymore. And the foreman says, no, no, John, you, you don't understand. You're exempted from service. You're not just deferred. You never have to serve because you are a master Navy welder. And he said, fine, thank you very much. Here's my chit. And he goes down and enlists in the United States Army. They put him in the 107th Infantry Division, which is being formed up at Fort Benning, Georgia. And he looks up one day and sees these guys coming down in these white things. And he says, who are they? And they said, paratroopers. And he said, I want to be one of those. And they said, go right over there and tell the first sergeant. He arrives in England in 1944 after the 82nd Airborne Division has already parachuted into North Africa and so in Sicily, and they've pulled him back out, and now 1943, 44, they're getting ready to invade across the English Channel. And he joins them as a sergeant. And he looks at the corporals who've already made two combat jumps and three combat operations, and he said, take on my stripes, I can't do this, and give orders to one of these guys who's already been in combat three times. And he takes a reduction in rank to become a private. I said, John, what's the most moving part of all the things that you've done? Because he also jumped into Nijmegen, the bridge too far, after he jumped into Normandy and been wounded. He said, the most moving part for me was, he says, I've been on a US government airplane seven times in my life. I got on, and we never landed. I jumped out of the airplanes. <laughs> this time, this time, meaning today, the government of the United States is going to put me on a U.S. Air Force plane and fly me to Normandy, and I'm going to land for the very first time. <laughs> now, here's the connection. And this, if you don't take anything from all of this, just think about this experience that we've commemorated today, 70 years ago today, at the time the biggest military operation in history, 2,500 aircraft parachuting 13,000 paratroopers. 80 battleships, cruisers, and destroyers offshore bombarding the German defenses on the beach. And the miracle of, of Rommel being back home to see his wife, of Adolf Hitler not being awakened until noon and then not even committing the armor until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And the weather that has by then turned so horrible you could not have done the, the operation on the 7th of June. The miracle of that window just opening long enough to put those paratroopers on the ground and all those soldiers coming across the beach at Omaha and Utah. And when you stand on that cemetery at the top of the hill, you realize the extraordinary sacrifice that's been made, not simply to keep this country free, but to offer others the hope of freedom. And there's a connection back to something else. I've often said when I've been here as Sandy's guests and yours, that I was sent to war by Lyndon Johnson, and my brother and I were brought home from war by Richard M. Nixon, and I will be forever grateful. For had he not done so, I would not be the father of four and the husband of one and the grandfather of 14. And had John Perosi not been a welder before he enlisted in the Army, perhaps the USS New Jersey would never have been built. And in February of 1969, when my rifle platoon is cut off on the DMZ of a place called Vietnam, the USS New Jersey fires all night long with its 16-inch guns to keep me and my rifle platoon alive. And so I, John tells me that story, and I tell him my part of that story. John looks at me and he says, well, 
I wondered who was to blame for Iran-Contra, and it turns out it's me. I am grateful. I am grateful to be here with you this evening. I, I want to make sure that we leave time for questions. And I want to just, if I may, just, I don't know if, Sandy, you took the book. Do we have a copy of the book? May I borrow your copy? Thank you. I'll be right back. Oh, thank you. So let, let me just tell you a little bit. The connections of life, which are so incredibly important, the ones I just told you about, that, that connected a, a paratrooper who's now 94, by the way, and walked the dogs off everybody when we were in San Mary Glees just a few weeks ago to shoot the documentary that you just saw here on the screen. The, 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 the connections of life that show you how important those things are. I first met Bob Hamer when he was helping us with Freedom Alliance to deal with all of the trauma from this war. Bob Hamer, former Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine, and 26 years in the FBI. I believe, I believe you've already been introduced, so I'm not going to do it again. But let me just tell you about this. We were working on a project together that to tell the story of the heroes on the home front, the hearts of the heroes. You see, the classical definition of a hero isn't somebody wearing a spandex suit and a cape. It's not somebody who catches a pass in the end zone on a Friday night football game. It's not someone who sets a new Olympic record. I, it's not a politician either. A hero is a person who puts themselves at risk for the benefit of others. And so Bob Hamer and I were working on several projects, and we decided there ought to be a book. And so we did. We did a beautiful book with over 300 color photographs in it. And in the midst of working on a book, and I, my, my work schedule says that I kind of do better on writing when I don't have the telephone ringing. So night after night after night, Bob and I are working on this book, trying to get it out, trying to finish it, make sure that the photos are on the right page with all the descriptions of these remarkable young Americans who have served in this war that I've been blessed to be able to go overseas and cover now 57 embeds. And Bob says to me in the middle of the night, he says, fiction is so much easier. <laughs> and it's true, it's true. Fiction is easier because if you don't like the quote, you can change it. <laughs> See, if you don't like the guy, you can kill him. <laughs> and I said, you know, we, what we ought to do is we ought to combine your experience and mine, and put out a book about it. And he says, great idea. Let's finish this one, and we'll start on the other one. And so we now have in this book, I just want to make sure everybody understands, and I'm trying not to be political, because I know that part of this, this wonderful library is now operated by the federal government. So Sandy has warned me, don't be political. The title, Counterfeit Lies, is not necessarily about the Obama administration. <laughs> and there are several times in here in which we had, we, you know, one of the great things about fiction, and Bob knows this because he's a gifted writer in his own right, but one of the great things about fiction is when you, Guys like Bob and I have signed so many non-disclosure agreements, you kind of forget what you promise not to tell people. So if you change enough of the dates, times, places, and names, you can get away with a lot. Even in this one, at the last minute, we have to go back and delete something that turned out to be more classified than either one of us thought it was at the time. Remember that? And I was really upset about it. I said, I can't believe they're still doing it that way. It turns out they are. I'm going to leave to your own imagination once you read the book, which, which event that is in this book. But it is about, remarkably enough, terrorism. It's about a hostage situation. It's about, it's just the way it works. It's just the way it works. You know, the next big story, I don't have the gift of prophecy, but the next big story that we're going to see is now that we've had all the scandals like, well, let's start with Fast and Furious, and then the IRS enemies list, and then spying on Americans, and then threatening my colleague James Rosen with being locked up for practicing the First Amendment, and then the, the horrific Benghazi scandal, and now the, the health care problems with the VA, and on top of all of that, they've won out and done it again with what's happening. The next big scandal, and, you, and I'm talking just weeks from now, is going to be how does the United States government respond 
when the Iranians make an announcement that they've ceased their nuclear program and we're now going to sign a deal with a bunch of other countries, seven others, that says all sanctions are now lifted. Oh, not, I, I don't have the gift of prophecy, but I can tell you that's the next thing to happen. It just happens that this book deals with that. <laughs> the answers are in the book. I want to, if I may, just invite my good friend Bob Hamer to come on up and, and just. That, now, Bob is usually the one that would ask the questions. And, and I've, you know, I've shot a lot of videotape. You ought to see the videotape he's made of the kinds of questions he would ask when he was posing undercover as an FBI agent. And the people he's dealing with are running guns and drugs and counterfeit money and coming into the United States with intent to do us great harm. He still knows some of those people. You get notes from him. I, I still get emails from many of them. Yeah. I, I had enough defense counsel say I was a really good fiction writer. Uh, they were usually referring to the affidavits I wrote about their clients. <laughs> but uh, so Ali and I decided to kind of use that gift of prevarication that I've, that I've developed over 26 years. When, you, when you've been an undercover agent for 26 years, about the only skill you walk away with is, is lying. So, uh, <laughs> and, and not too many people are looking to hire a pathological liar. So. I'm fortunate that, that Ali has accepted me uh, in his circle of friends. If counterfeit lies, if you've seen the new $100 bill, uh, come on, some of you have. Uh, this, is, this is actually the result of, of an undercover case in which I, I was involved, uh, Operation Smoking Dragon on the, on the West Coast, Operation Royal Charm on the East Coast. And we were able to prove that North Korea actually does counterfeit our $100 bills. It's called the super note. And it is an act of war to counterfeit another nation's currency. This is the basis for our book. When, when I kind of threw out this case to Colonel North, he said that should, be, that should be the basis of our book, this whole undercover operation. And we put together in, in 300 pages, we sort of combined a three-year case in which I was undercover for three years. We started with one person. We ended up indicting about 87. Uh, it started with counterfeit cigarettes. It evolved into a $60 million surface-to-air missile deal with uh, surface-to-air missiles with the Chinese government, and it evolved into the North Korean supernote. My wife is still mad at me. The North Koreans were going to make me the exclusive distributor of the supernote. 40. <laughs> They were going to give me $40 million a year to distribute, and I, we wrapped up the case, and I didn't keep any samples, so. Now, there, there's a moment in the, thank you, Bill. There is a moment in the book when the FBI undercover agent by the name of Jake Cruz, uh, Jake Cruz, it turns out, has been admonished by his superiors for uh, apparently uh, some incorrect language in a, in a missive sent off to the FBI headquarters. Would any of this be related to, to the document that I hold in my hand dated May 14, 2003? Uh, you, you, you write what you know, and uh, <laughs> in the opening scene in the book, there is a, a situation where Jake acknowledges that he used some improper language in an official communication to headquarters. and. There's a lot of Jake Cruz in, I mean, there's a lot of Bob Hamer in the Jake Cruz character. Jake is better looking and has more hair and is younger, but <laughs> May I? North has the... Uh, May I? Uh, I, have, I have the evidence. I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed, but yeah. I, I, this is a, a missive sent in, in his personnel file, the real thing. This is the real FBI document. And I'm only going to read a part of it, and I'm going to sanitize it without the names. In that, in that email, Special Agent Hamer, utilizing vulgarities criticized a decision by another person requiring a, another activity to be converted to such and so. S.A. Hamer, Special Agent Hamer, was admonished that this email is a public document of the FBI and that his use of vulgarities and the tone of his criticism was unprofessional, unacceptable, and would not be tolerated. 
I just love someone who takes on a bureaucracy like that. So, let, let me, if I may, just, just tell you one true story about my, my relationship with uh, well, I, let, me, let me do two things. Let me, one, encourage you to do uh, everything you can to encourage others to recognize the extraordinary sacrifice that's been made by young Americans on battlefields all over the world, particularly on such a day as this. I want to just show you a, a, a very quick clip of a young United States Marine in Afghanistan whose wife is a U.S. Marine helicopter pilot. And we shot this with the intention of putting it on the air and then at the last minute decided not to. But let me just show you a young Marine captain and what he thinks of some of the decisions that are being made in Washington today. My name is uh, Captain Matt Lampert. This is my uh, second combat deployment to uh, Afghanistan. And uh, I just wish uh, American people would understand there's a lot of people here that still believe in what we're doing out here. And, uh, and are willing to come back again and again to, uh, to prove that point. You can probably tell why we didn't put that on the air. Uh, it's, it's shocking. And yet that is a level of commitment to this country, the likes of which has kept us free. It's freed the people of France and the rest of Europe. It freed the people every time we stood up and fought for them. And it gave them the hope of freedom that they otherwise would never have had. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be that kind of a recognition today. And that is unfortunate. The other part of it is that I had the great blessing of serving a president who truly did believe in who we are. And I have a, a wonderful uh, account of my time that I spent with President Nixon. And it was a privilege to do so. And I'm going to just close with this, this very brief clip about what President Reagan said about America's heroes. But I want to just give you one last vignette about my experience with President Nixon. In the 1980s, President Reagan convened what came to be called the Kissinger Commission, in which every former president was asked to come and testify. And President Nixon willingly stepped up to the plate. You may remember President Ford was still alive and President Carter was still alive. No, maybe he wasn't. Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry, but, but your job, Bob, is to keep me out of trouble, remember? You're covering my six. Still alive. Yeah, gotcha. okay, still alive, thank you. thank you. Thank you for letting me know that Carter is still alive, because it was hard to tell even then. Uh, <laughs> my job as the NSC staff uh, officer for this endeavor was to contact each of the former presidents, invite them to come and testify with a letter from President Reagan, and I did so. President Ford very graciously said, yeah, fly out to Aspen, bring with, it, with you what you want me to say, and I'll be glad to go and read it to him. And it's, that's fine. President Carter said, I don't want to have any of your stuff. I've got my own sources. Thank you very much. And President Nixon started calling me the day that the missive arrived, because my name was on it. President Reagan said, if you need any questions, contact then Major North. President Nixon called right away from Teaneck, New Jersey, and said, well, I want the following instruments. I want you to send me the following. And he gave me a long list of things I didn't think he'd even know about. And I dutifully got the White House Communications Agency to install about six big safes and a White House courier that communicated back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Teaneck, New Jersey on a near daily basis. And then we put in a secure telephone up there for him to call me. On one occasion, he called me up and he said, Oliver, I've just read what you sent me today. <laughs> and I just want you to know, I've read it all. Who did the CIA analysis in that? I told him the name of the CIA. Very well. Who did the cover memorandum? I said, well, sir. I did. Well, it's a piece of crap. <laughs> we had many other great occasions, one of which was to bring him down, and, and he came after, after Presidents Ford and Carter had, had come and testified before the commission. President Carter brought 38 pages handwritten on yellow legal tablet, which is undoubtedly in his library at this point. And at, after an hour and 15 minutes of him reading from this document that he'd written, everyone was asleep. <laughs> and he got up and left. President Nixon showed up for his day, and it was the day 
that KAL 007 had been shot down. And so the first thing he wanted to know was, what has President Reagan already said about this? And I said, here it is, sir. And he calls from the back of the car as we're leaving from National Airport. It wasn't called Reagan Airport yet. And then driving over to the State Department, he got out and all the press in the world was there and he just nuked them. Those bastards. <laughs> I don't know if that made it into the clip on, it was aired on, but he, it just nailed him for the atrocity that had been committed with the loss of the aircraft. Richard Nixon sat down at the table without a note. He said, I'm gonna talk for about 45 minutes. Then I'll take 45 minutes of your questions. And then the major's gonna take me back to the airport and I'm flying back on the Eastern shuttle. And he did. Without a note, he started at the Rio Grande River and went to Tierra del Fuego, knew the name of every head of state, everything that was going on in each one of those countries, socioeconomic, justice, security, military, knew it all without a note. And I watched as I sat there in the back of the room Henry Kissinger, who I'd thought was the guy that was the architect of all this foreign policy. And Kissinger sat, sitting there with a great big smile, realizing this is the best lesson on foreign policy any of the rest of these people have ever gotten. And Henry Kissinger had gotten the same kind of lesson from Richard Milhouse Nixon. One last quick story about President Nixon. The night of my first testimony in July of 1987 when I was invited, well actually I was subpoenaed. <laughs> Asked me to come and have a little chat with him. And that first night afterwards, I got home, and my lovely wife and I knew we, had, we were living with 35 federal agents at the time. That's a lot of coffee. We had an unlisted phone number, but we knew it was being tapped. I'd asked that it be tapped. I'd asked that it be recorded so that I would have proof that if anything ever went off the rails, there would be proof that I had asked NSA to record everything so that somebody wouldn't think that I was off on my own. And it was a wise decision. One of the very few I've really made in life besides marrying the woman I did. Because it was all of those transcripts that exonerated me in the end. There were four phone calls that came through that night. One was from Billy Graham. One was from Ronald Reagan. One was from the Commandant of the Marine Corps, P.X. Kelly. And the fourth call was from Richard Milhouse Nixon. I asked both Reverend Graham and President Nixon, how did you get my phone number? And they both said the same thing. We called the White House operator. <laughs> Reverend Graham said he was praying for us. The Commandant said I deported myself as a Marine should. President Reagan said what he later said to Hugh Seide at Time Magazine. I don't consider myself to be your hero, but I've been blessed to keep company with them. And then Richard Nixon, Oliver, I watched every minute of it today. That was a magnificent presentation. And it had the additional merit of being the truth. Somewhere, somewhere in the files of National Security Agency, that phone call is recorded and I want the copy to see how good my imitation is. I want to just close with just a very brief little recollection of, of the president I was blessed to serve at the White House as he talks about America's heroes so appropriate for today, 70 years after Normandy. Josh? If we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land, we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David, 
They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kind of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bellow Wood, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Port Chop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. We must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. We are Americans. Sandy, we'd be pleased to take your questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Colonel. And uh, as he says, he has agreed to some questions. So uh, if you will raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. And you can stand and state your name and ask the question. Linda D'Ambrosio, I just want to thank you for being a thread that has helped to weave the fabric that holds our nation together and for can you, continuing to carry the torch. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Linda. It's kind of you. We're going to... We're going to use some questions that came in on email on our live stream from around the country. So I'm going to ask those from three by five cards that the fellows have written down. Are there any terrorists, do you think, in the United States? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hate to give up the secret, but yes, there are. Uh, you know, even here in here in the Los Angeles, Orange County area, we have the Joint Terrorism Task Force. I don't know if we have any members here in the audience, but uh, you know the work that's being done. A lot of it doesn't get publicized, but, but yes, there are people that are out here to destroy this country and destroy this nation uh, and the very fabric of the nation, and they're, they're doing it under the, under the flag of, uh, of a religion that's, that's bent on, on making this country um, less than it is. Great, thank you. We have a gentleman over here on your left, sir. My name is J.R. Nichols, and I'm actually the founder of the Global War on Terror Wall of Remembrance. It's a traveling memorial that travels, travels around the country and carries 11,000 from the bombing of the barracks in Beirut in 1983 to current day and actually to today's news. Um, first off, I want to say welcome home to you, Colonel North, and all Vietnam veterans that are in this room today. Thank you. In your, in, your, in your book that you wrote prior to this one, what was the greatest experience you took from that book? You're talking about heroes proved, and I appreciate the plug. Uh, 
and I was here with you as proved as well. Uh, look, the takeaway is that if at the end of the day, we have not awakened to one, the threat within, and number two, we allow a government that's gonna continue to deceive us about the nature of the threat, who is the threat, why they do it, th to deny the reality of, for example, radical jihad, radical Islamic jihad. To not even say those words to the American people, it is not only disingenuous, it's dangerous. And I mean, that is the bottom line of the message that's in Heroes Proved, and quite frankly, it's very much the part of the message here in, in this book because it is a threat to the future. And I, look, we both have a stake in this. Here's our stake. I have 14 grandkids. Bob's got grand, grandkids. I want my children and my grandchildren to have the same opportunities for freedom that I had. I don't want the government taking them away. I want the government to protect us as the Constitution requires. And if we stop making that a requirement in, in our government, that, for our government, then we've made a terrible mistake. That the oath to the support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that he and I took ought to apply to every one of them, no matter what office they hold in Washington. Colonel, Colonel, speaking of your book, what is the symbol that's on the front, on, on the book jacket? Ah, that is the, the symbol that you see is the insignia of the Pazderan, which is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps fields not only the Quds Force, which is special operations units like those that operate in Syria today, it is also the organization within Iran responsible for building, acquiring, and the means of delivering nuclear weapons. All right, a physical trainer here, back here in the rear of the room, directly in front of you, a physical trainer from Fullerton, California. First, I want to say thank you so much for your service and devotion to the country, and it's a real honor to have you with us here today. Now to my question, uh, as a military expert, what in your opinion has been the most effective strategy in our prosecution and execution of the global war on terror? I think uh, General Mattis was here, uh, was it last week, uh, Sandy? Yes, Ge sir. General Jim Memorial Mattis? Day. General Memorial Jim Mattis Day. had once been one of my lieutenants. He was here about 10 days ago. I think he put it better than I could. Some people just have to be killed. <laughs> Bob, I may have left out an expletive in there. But, uh, <laughs> a young lady from La Mirada, California. Hi, Colonel. My name is Carrie, and Colonel, you are a great American, and we are so delighted to have you in our hometown today. Um, Colonel, my prayer is for your safety, and my prayer is also that you'll have the opportunity to go back to Washington and encourage our senators, our congressmen, to get these impeachment things going because you know something we cannot um, I just um, I don't know I don't have a question I just want to oh <laughs> thank you that was a great that was a great statement sir my name is Stan in Toronto I'm a member of the local American Legion 679 we work for the welfare of uh, vets around the world but especially here in the United States of course Colonel, I'm going to ask you a frank question. You have a real sense of what is going on. There's a lot of people in this country now that are very frustrated and fearful. In your opinion, we got another two and a half years to go under the present environment. Do we have the ability, in your opinion, to rise above it after this is this crucifixion is over? Well, I, I think that the most serious damage that's been done to the office of the presidency has been done in the last five years. I, if you look at what's the catastrophe that is out there just bubbling, uh, it's going to be very difficult for the next president. And I, I don't know if I can say this or not, Sandy, but I hope it's a Republican. And, uh, <laughs> huh? and so I, I think it's going to be very difficult to govern as a president needs to given the track record that's been established the last five years. I think it, it, the wreckage is gonna go on for decades. And, I, and let me say this in, the, in, the, in the, the library of the president who saved my brothers and my life because he brought us home from that war. And since I'm a life member of the Legion, and by the way, the Legion was first to stand up and demand action 
on this horrific treatment of our veterans in the Veterans Administration. Let, let, let me make an observation. This, the president for whom this library is dedicated was resigned under the pressure of a possible impeachment. Okay? If he had done one-tenth as much as this president has done to destroy the credibility of the United States of America, he would have been impeached. But the reality is this president has gotten away with things that Richard Milhouse Nixon could never have dreamed of. And he should have at, at some point stood up and said, I accept responsibility. In fact, at today's speech that he gave at Normandy, he talked about himself. I'm sick and tired of hearing about him. Colonel. Thank you. Thank you for those good words about Richard Nixon. Another question from our, uh, from our email live stream. Looking back on the last seven years under the present administration and secretaries of state, is the United States safer or better off or has more influence anywhere in the world today? There's no place I could consider that we have greater influence. I mean, the whole, the whole goal of our national security policy is to be at least respected, if not feared, by adversaries and trusted by our allies. And there is not a country in the world in which I can go. And I, if you look at the foreword in this book, it was written in Israel, where I was told about the story that's in the book. And, and I look at that and I say, there's one of our most crucial allies that no longer trusts us. Think about what's happened in Ukraine since this administration has just let Vladimir Putin run wild as the next czar of Russia. And now consider if you were an official in Manila, or Seoul, South Korea, or Tokyo, or Amman, Jordan, or Jerusalem, would you trust this administration to back up its pledges? And the answer, of course, is no. Colonel, a retired college professor from Fullerton. Hi. I'd like to know your take on the Bergdahl matter. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. I bet you have an opinion on that, you, sir. You and Sean Hannity and I, <laughs> look, uh, very, very quickly, uh, in a short form. I don't know what Bo Bergdahl did or didn't do. I've heard a lot. I do know his parents. I've met with them. I do know that he was held not by the Taliban, but by an organization called the Haqqani Network. And, and my FBI colleague can tell you more things about the Haqqanis than I can. And it's a criminal enterprise. It's operated there for centuries. And they wanted, up until a short while ago, all they wanted was money. They never mentioned in their conversations that they had with intermediaries anything but money, because that's what they've been doing for centuries. Sometimes the payment for hostages was come in the form of opium, sometimes in guns, sometimes in cocaine, sometimes in cash. But that's all they wanted. And suddenly we now find that five of the most brutal terrorists on the planet Earth in the Taliban have been exchanged for his freedom. I don't know when it changed. I do know that someone in this administration needs to get up and tell the American people the truth about why they added those five terrorists to the mix. <laughs> Second, I, Bob Hamer and I both lived under the military justice system. I know there's a lot of stuff that people talk about the military justice system, but in point of fact, it's about the fairest you could possibly find. It guarantees you a, period, a, a jury of your peers. I asked for a court-martial in 1988 when I was indicted by the special, persecutor, or the special prosecutor. <laughs> and I asked for a court-martial because I knew it would be a fair trial. What has to happen now is that some senior U.S. Army general in the chain of command of Sergeant Bergdahl needs to convene what's called an Article 32 investigation, which is, Bob, am I correct? It's the, it's the military equivalent of a grand jury. And give this man a chance to explain what he did. And he deserves justice, whether it's justice to him or justice for him. He deserves that. And so, Rather than having on all these people with various parts of hearsay, and I heard that he did this, I heard that he did that, fairness, which after all is something that's very dear and dear to the hearts of most Americans, demands 
that the Army senior officer who is responsible convene that investigation and then make a determination should there be a court martial. And if so, he'll have a chance to fully defend himself. But other than that, he'll never have justice, nor will we. Colonel, the co-founder of the Orange County Children's Book Festival from Costa Mesa. Thank you. Simplify, Colonel. Oh, this you. question is actually for Bob, if I may. Bob, during your time at the CIA, did you do any work with Tony Mendez, which we know from Argo? And is any of that in the book? Okay, I, I was with the FBI. I actually tried to get into the CIA and took a personality test and scored a zero. <laughs> True story, the psychologist said he'd never seen a zero personality. Uh, so, so, I'm gonna pass on the question. But I do read children's books, too, so. Uh, uh, we have a gentleman. Let, let me just, if I may very quickly. I, I know Tony, and the, the, the movie Argo is a great story about him. And he did the makeup on one of the clandestine services officers who accompanied me to Tehran. And, and made him look like someone other than the former deputy station chief in Tehran. So the bad guys who are now running the country of Iran didn't know that it was who it was. Colonel North. Yes, sir. Being a Marine, and we honor you this day for all the good work you've done. <clears throat> if you were in charge of the White House, what would you do to get our Marine out of Mexico? Yeah. I, this, this may show up in our next novel, but I'm going to be at, at, I'm going to be at Camp Pendleton tomorrow at the, at the Marine Exchange at Camp Pendleton. Bob and I are going to be there signing our book. And one of the things that I have suggested, I don't know if he can be a party to this because he lives very close to Camp Pendleton, but I'm going to suggest that two or 300 Marines get in their pickup trucks and follow me to the border. And each, and each one of us, when we get to the border, as you go through the system, you go, oh, gosh, I may have a gun in my truck. And stop right there. It will shut down the border for at least two weeks. And at some point, somebody in Mexico will go, oh, well, maybe we better let this guy go, because this is going to keep up, and all trade is going to stop. And so I, I'm going to, anybody want to join me tomorrow? We'll get in the pickup trucks. A young, a young lady from from uh, Mission Vallejo, who represents the Liberty Soldier Network. American Soldier Network, hi, Annie Nelson. First, thank you to both of you and Bob and every other person in this room that's ever served our country. Thank you very much. Other than being frustrated and an American that can vet out candidates and vote, what would you suggest everyone in this room that is boiling with anger do to help take back our country that we can personally do? I'd be very, very straightforward about it. I, I think that what we've got to do is make, and I, again, this is very partisan. The United States Senate is the biggest roadblock to truth and justice and fairness in America today because of one reason. There's not enough people in the other party in office. Now, I, several years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer, the, the doctor suggested, after I finally got out of the VA system, the doctor suggested that I have radiation treatment. And I said, I, I can't have radiation treatment because the only person I know of that had radiation for cancer is Senator Arlen Specter. And it turned him into a liberal Democrat. <laughs> and so I'd rather die of cancer than die a liberal Democrat. <laughs> but other than that, I think you ought to nominate Bob Hamer, who is a resident of California, to replace Barbara Boxer. Yeah, hey, yeah. Um, that's great. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up with one more question from our uh, live stream audience. Uh, Colonel, what, what should the United States do to prevent a nuclear Iran? I think the best thing that anybody could do to prevent a nuclear Iran is to read counterfeit lies. Because <laughs> the answer's in the book. And I, thank you for that setup. That was beautiful. Uh, I, I honestly do believe that the United States needs to really pay attention. It, the truth is not being told to the American people. It, the, the administration is lying repeatedly. I know that there, there are some who contend to that, but the reality of it is that is the next big threat that we're going to have to face. And at some point, 
the country where I wrote the prologue to this book, the, the very, not the prologue, but the acknowledgments in the front of the book. And that book does test the whole issue of doing the right thing when everything else seems wrong. And that's the situation Jake Cruz has put in. Somebody has to be able to do that. Someone has to be able to tell the truth about what this administration has done. And someone is gonna to have to act quickly to keep them from getting a nuclear weapon. And I can assure you this is as sure as we're standing here, because I don't have the gift of prophecy, but I do have common sense. The country of Israel, in which you see the words never again, that's not a political slogan. It is a way of life. And they will not wait to be nuked first. Thank you, Colonel North. He's agreed to sign your books, which you know are for sale in the gift shop. And I promise you, if you buy one at the regular price, the second one will be sold to you at the same price. No increase in price. All of you who come here frequently know that we give lavish, one-of-a-kind, custom-made gifts. Tonight's selection is the What Would Nixon Do mug? It is a limited edition. As you've heard me say before, limited only to the amount we can sell. <laughs> it's available to, to you in the gift shop when you buy your book, and it's presented to uh, the Colonel now. Bob, I should have one, where'd you go? Where'd here, you have no, one for you, here, you his. as well. Here's his. Oh, here's, oh, that's yours, <laughs> that's yours. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming. He'll be in the lobby to sign your books. God bless you and God bless America.